Seminary education is on the decline. Uh, it's really on the decline within the United States and honestly within, within the world. And seminary education, when I say it's on the decline, I mean that in two different ways. Uh, first of all, I mean that seminary education is on the decline numerically. And numerically, meaning there's not that many students who desire to attain or go after a seminary education. Those numbers are going down. Because students are asking the question, why would I go to seminary? Why would I pursue, let me maybe even say it a little bit broader, why would I pursue a theological education? What's the point of a theological education? education. And when I say also that theological education is on the decline, not only do I mean numerically, but theological education is on the decline in terms of content. Uh, if you look at the content of theological education across the board, it's being traded out for church growth classes, self-help classes, because we've lost a focus on what exactly it means, what exactly is theological education? What are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to do when we do this thing that we call theological education? What is it? What purpose does it have? The culture at large really is, over the last several decades, maybe even we could say centuries, relegated theological education to the corner within the wider scope of education and what education is. The culture at large, I'm making very blanket statements here, but the culture at large really doesn't quite understand what to do with theological education. What purpose does it have? What place does it have? And so because there's a lack of understanding, because there is a lack of desire for theological education, we see that it's on the decline. But let me, let me shift gears just a second and say, if I were to ask you, what's the goal of your theological education, how would you respond to that? What's the goal of your theological education? What are you trying to achieve with your theological education? What's your purpose? If you were to say learning Greek, you'd be wrong. If you were to say, I, I want to learn how to read the Old Testament in Hebrew, I would say that is not the goal and should not be the goal of your theological education. You've mistaken a tool for the goal of what you're trying or what you should be trying to accomplish. Don't mistake the tools that you're learning, the tools, the essential tools that you're learning, don't mistake those for the goal that you're supposed to have in theological education. So again, what is the goal of theological education. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Ultimately, I would say that what theological education seeks to accomplish is a comprehension, an understanding that brings about a formation, that brings about a change. Maybe a simpler way to say this is just to say Christ-likeness. The goal of theological education is Christ-likeness. But it's comprehension that is leading to a change, comprehension that's leading to sanctification. You're studying, you're pursuing, you're trying to understand all of these things for the sake of comprehension that's going to change you. But we have a problem. We have a major problem when it comes to comprehension. Because the way in which we comprehend things uh, can be problematic. Let me give you an example. If I were to say, uh, what is humility for you? And you try to explain to me, what is humility? How do I comprehend humility? How do I understand exactly what humility is? In our terms, as we're describing what humility is, we're describing it from our perspective. You know, let me open that door for you. No, you, you go first. Or I'm not really that good in Greek. You know, I'm, I'm not really that good in Hebrew. We think of humility in those terms. When we put that up against Christ's humility, we see that our comprehension, our understanding of what humility is, is on a level that is infinitesimal, total, <laughs> infinitesimally small or lower than a correct understanding of what humility truly is. 
in terms of what Christ's humility was. What did it mean for Christ to be humble? What did it mean for him to take on that humility? We have a problem when it comes to comprehension in our theological education. We have a problem because we can't comprehend. Honestly, we can't fully understand. If we think about uh, the semantically rich words that we use every day, words like humility, words like love, words like patience, words like kindness, we realize that we fall very, very short of a correct understanding, of a correct comprehension of what those things truly are. So how is it then, as seminary students, as just students of the word, how is it that we can accomplish our goal of comprehension? The goal is not learning the Greek, learning the Hebrew. That's a tool that leads us towards our goal. But how do we accomplish that goal if we have difficulty comprehending even a simple word like humility, a simple word like love? Well, thankfully, the Lord has given us a path forward in comprehension to understand The Lord has paved a way for us to understand. Turn to Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1.1. I love the opening of the book of Proverbs because it's seeking to answer this very issue, this very question. Now, Proverbs 1.1 through, let's go through verse 6. I want you to count up all of the words that we have here for understanding, for comprehension. Okay, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. In order to understand wisdom and instruction, to comprehend words of insight, in order to grasp uh, the instruction of insight or success. We're almost running out of ways in which to translate all of the words that Solomon is using for comprehension. Okay, righteousness and justice and order, organization. Verse 4, in order to give to the simple ones cunning. We should translate ormas as cunning. To those who are simple, knowledge. And mezima, discretion, comprehension, understanding. Solomon opens up his proverbs by saying, I want to understand. I want to comprehend. I, I, the whole point of the book is I want to understand. In order, he doesn't even give a, a, he doesn't even give a complete sentence for verse 2. He doesn't even start with a complete sentence. He just says, in order to understand. He doesn't even say, I want to understand. Let us all work together to understand. He just says, in order to understand. I just want to understand. I want to comprehend. I want to know. I want instruction. I want wisdom. I want understanding. I want cunningness. I want learning. I want counsel. I want discretion. I want all of these things. So he sets this all up for us in the first six verses and says, I want to understand. I want to know. I want to comprehend. Verse seven, he tells us the basis of it. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of understanding. Your whole goal in seminary education and theological education, let me say your whole goal in in terms of the life that you're living as a Christian is to comprehend, to understand, to be changed in light of that understanding, to be changed in light of that comprehension of who God is, of who Christ is. Where do you have to start? According to Solomon, you have to start with the fear of Yahweh. You have to start with fear. Notice when he says, when Solomon says, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, 
he puts no disclaimer on knowledge. He does not say the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of theological knowledge. Or the fear of, of Yahweh is the beginning of uh, seminary education knowledge. He puts no boundaries around his word here for knowledge. Just says, fear of Yahweh, that's the beginning of knowledge. If you want to understand, if you want to comprehend, no direct object here. If you just want to understand, comprehend, fear of Yahweh is the beginning of that. Now, let me turn this a little bit for verse 7 and say, contrastively, in contrast to this, if we take out the fear of Yahweh, then what do we have left? And this is the world system, the world system of understanding, the world system of education. Let me even use that term. Factual knowledge without the fear of Yahweh is meaningless. It's pointless. It's bound up within a system that's just repetitive. The world seeks to understand. The world seeks to comprehend, but it cannot ever break out of the system in which it's in. And the system, in terms of the world as we see right now, is production for the sake of consumption. I want to learn so that I can make more money. Oh, why do you want to make more money? So I can live an easier life and consume more. Why do you want to consume more? I don't know. It's a system that doesn't ever get anywhere. The education that is not based, the learning, let me even use a more general term, the learning that is not based on the fear of God is just in a continual system that never goes anywhere. Sure, we can accomplish all kinds of things. We've got iPhones now. We've got computers. We've got all sorts of things that have been developed. But education hasn't gone anywhere in terms of secular education, in terms of comprehending, in terms of understanding and knowing. Theological education used to be understood as the, the queen of the sciences. If you want to be a good scientist, and you should be a good scientist, we need good scientists. If you want to be a good scientist, you need to understand it from the perspective of a correct theology. If you want to be a good engineer, and you want to be productive as an engineer, biblically, you need to understand it from the correct perspective. Theological education, which should govern all of education, and I don't mean theological edu education in terms of seminary, classroom only. I mean your learning theologically. That theological education, which should govern all of our learning, govern all of our perspective, all of our worldview, has been traded aside. It's been put in the corner because the world doesn't know what to do with it. It's been relegated to church growth and self-help. So education within the world, trying to understand, trying to comprehend within the world system is meaningless. It's meaningless. Just in a continual cycle, a continual system that's meaningless. Chavel, chavelim, chavel, chavelim, Amar kohelet, hakol hevel. Meaningless, 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 says kohelet. Everything is meaningless. There's a reason that, a, that Solomon starts out his next book, Ecclesiastes, with that statement. Because he's just describing the system that I've just been talking about. All is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. It's all hevel. If you think about education, you think about growth, you think about comprehension and understanding only in terms of this cycle, production for the sake of consumption or however that looks, and you don't have the basis of your understanding and your comprehension in the fear of God, then what's it going to lead to? It's going to lead to meaninglessness. 
Solomon asks a question right after that, Ecclesiastes 1.1. He says, what advantage does a man have in all his labor? What advantage does a man have in all of his labor? If I were to ask an unsaved person that, they would think that's a silly question. They would think that's a silly question. What advantage does a man have in all of his, all of his labor? Well, $30 an hour, right? $40 an hour. What advantage does a man have in building a house? In all the labor in which he toils to build that house. Well, he's got a house now, right? Solomon comes back and asks the same question. But what advantage does a man have in all of his labor? What's he accomplishing? What's he doing? How's he progressing? What's he accomplishing? And the unsafe person responds, I I just told you, $30 an hour. I get $30 an hour for every hour that I work. But what advantage does a man have in all of his labor? Solomon is saying, without understanding the fear of Yahweh, without comprehending the fear of Yahweh, then it's meaningless. You have no advantage. You produce so you can consume, so you can produce, so you can consume. And one day, you die. Solomon ends Ecclesiastes by saying the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God. Keep his commandments. After everything's been heard, after all of this inductive study in Ecclesiastes, what's the conclusion? Fear God. If you want to make progress, you want to have advantage, you want to comprehend, you want to understand, what do you do? Where do you start? Fear God. Proverbs, see, starts with the thesis statement. Proverbs 1.7 starts with the thesis statement. In a sense, you can think of Proverbs as being deductive. Let's start with the thesis statement and then try to understand everything from there. Ecclesiastes is the opposite. Ecclesiastes is inductive. Ecclesiastes says, let's take a look at everything in the world. Let's take a look at all of these systems that man has set up. Let's take a look at all of these things that man is trying to accomplish Let's take a look at all of the hevel. Let's take a look at all the meaninglessness. And it ends inductively with fear God. But the question we still have to answer is, what is the fear of God? What is the fear of God? Turn to uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20. Exodus 20, I is a brilliant passage in helping us to begin to understand the fear of God. We, in, a, in the context of seminary education in which we find ourselves, we want comprehension. I don't want to just memorize the tools. I don't want to just memorize the Greek grammar so that I can read in Greek and sound really smart. I want to comprehend. I want to know. I want to understand How does the fear of God, how is it the beginning? How is it the basis for that? What is the fear of God? Ecclesiastes 20, let's start in verse 18. You guys know the context of Ecclesi- or, uh, excuse me, Exodus 20. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and they stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but let not God speak to us, or we're going to die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. What's curious? Moses is saying, don't be afraid, instead, fear. Don't fear, in contrast to that, fear. Right, so Moses can be saying fear only in terms of what we're thinking, terror. We've got a lot of things that we uh, say against the Israelites. Right, we say, man, they were so slow to learn. They never got it. Uh, they were always rebellious. They just never, they didn't quite grasp it. They didn't understand. They're so slow to learn. Why didn't they learn? You know what the one thing is that Israelites learned and they learned very quickly? Terror. The Israelites learned terror 
very quickly. You don't have to turn there, but Numbers chapter 17, verse 14. The term in Hebrew is magefa. Magefa is a plague. We don't know what it was. We have no idea what the magefa was, what the plague was, what the description of it was. We see a little bit of a, of a description about a plague from God uh, in Zechariah 14, 12. You can take a look at that and some of the description of that plague. In number 17, Israel's grumbling against God. Israel grumbles against God. Why have you done this? Moses, why are you leading us here? What are you doing? They grumble against God. And God starts to send the magefa, the plague, against them. Moses recognizes this, goes to Aaron immediately, and says, Aaron, you need to go and offer incense right now. In the time that it takes for Aaron to go from that conversation, get the incense, offer it on the altar, 14,700 Israelites died of the plague. Israel, Israel understood terror. They learned terror quickly. They understood it. But then we read in Deuteronomy 5.29, Yahweh is speaking and it says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments always. How would they not fear Yahweh? They're terrified. Imagine us in this room and suddenly 15 are struck with the plague. We understand terror immediately. We grasp what that fear is. But Yahweh says, no, 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 they don't have the fear of me in them. It's not as though they're not terrified enough. We have to separate out, as we're trying to define and understand what is the fear of Yahweh, we have to separate out or delimit a particular understanding of this fear that's being talked about. It's not only terror. Israelites had terror. Moses says to them, don't be afraid. Instead, be afraid. That second be afraid has to be something that's more precise, more concise in our understanding. That's what we're trying to get at. That's what we're trying to understand. What exactly is that fear? Because again, According to Proverbs, according to Job, according to Ecclesiastes, it's that fear that's the key for you in your comprehension. Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13. Now, Israel, what does Yahweh your God require from you but to fear Yahweh your God in order to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, in order to keep, to keep the commands of Yahweh and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. What does God require from you? Fear him, love him, serve him. Simple. One of the best texts for us to understand what is the fear of God is Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I want you to turn there. Ecclesiastes 3. What exactly is the fear of God? I could point you to several other passages about the fear of God. What is the fear of God? Proverbs 15, 33, you can write that down. Proverbs 22, 4, humility is the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 22, 4. Humility in what way? Ecclesiastes 3 helps to answer that question. If you take a look at Ecclesiastes 3, let's just start in, in verse 1. There's a thesis statement, a beginning statement, a a title even, if you will. Now, there is a time for everything and a season for every matter under the sun. There's a time for everything. And we say, okay, sure. There's a time to give birth or a time to be born and a time to die. Time to plant, time to uproot what is planted. Time to kill, a time to heal. Time to, to, a time to tear down, a time to build up. A time for this, a time for that, a time for this, a time for that. Time for this, time for that, all the way through verse 8. 
time for war, time for peace. It's a time for this and there's a time for that. And we say, sure, okay. Yeah, what, 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 are, you, what are you getting at, Solomon? What are you trying to say? What's the purpose of you telling us that there's a time for all of these things? I recognize that there's a time that I was born and I recognize that there is a time in which I will die. I understand that, but what are you getting at? What's your point? Now, Solomon, very important for us to recognize what he says right after this. Take a look at 3.14 in particular. Okay, 3.14. I know that everything that God does will remain forever. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. There's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to take from it. God has so worked so that men would fear him. So Solomon, in saying there's a time for this and a time for that and a time for this and a time for that, what he's saying is God is sovereign over those times. Solomon begins to help us understand and change our thinking about what do I mean by the fear of God? When Solomon uses the term fear of God in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, other places that we see this particular idea of the fear of God, not only terror of what God is going to do to me, but fear of God, what exactly does he mean by that? He says God is sovereign over all of these times. God has orchestrated, instituted, and purposed these times. There is nothing that will be added to it. There's nothing that will be taken away from it. Just as you had a point in time in which you were conceived, in which you were then born, so there is a point in time in which you will die or be raptured. Let's hope for that. There is a point in time in which God is sovereign over, orchestrated, brought about, and you have no idea when that is. You have no idea when that is. I have no idea when that is. There's a time to plant and a time to sow. There's a time to tear down and a time to build up. And the relationship between the fear and wisdom, as Solomon is explaining it, is that wisdom is something in which we're trying to comprehend. We're trying to understand why have things been orchestrated this way. They are orchestrated this way. God is sovereign over it. He's determined the times, and he said, I'm sovereign over this. There's a time for war, and there's a time for peace. And I'm sovereign over all of those things. Wisdom is trying to understand why God has orchestrated it that way. Wisdom goes into the minutia of life. It goes into all of the events of life, and it asks, why is it this way? Why has God set it up this way? Why is God doing this right now? Why is he, why? I want to comprehend. I want to understand. I want to know. Well, the only way for you to comprehend, the only way for you to know is to recognize God's sovereignty. So fear of God is me, first of all, recognizing my place before God. I have to first recognize and understand God has orchestrated all of these things. I have to understand my place before God. I have to to understand who I am and try to understand who God is. I have to understand my place before him. Now, knowing your place before God, this is where an element of dread comes into this idea of the fear of God. Because if I recognize my place before God, I'm trying to understand everything that I am, everything that I am in my nature, and I'm trying to understand everything that God is. And like the Israelites, when I put together my nature with God, I've got, I've got issues, I've got problems, I've got magefa that breaks out because God cannot abide with our sin. Knowing your place before God This fear of God, this produces a dread of God. It's not only dread of God. Fear of God as described by Solomon. It's not only a terror. 
The Israelites had terror, but they didn't have fear of God in the correct way. This understanding of our place before God brings about dread. It also brings about humility. Think of, again, of Proverbs 22.4. It brings about dependence. It brings about wisdom. Because if I want to understand everything in the world, if I want to understand what's going on in the world and why things are happening in the world as they are, I have to start from the right place. I have to, I have to start from a correct understanding of who God is. Job 28, 23 through 28, one of my most favorite passages, God understands the way to wisdom. God created the roadmap when he made creation. And he says, you want to understand everything that I've done? You want to comprehend what I'm accomplishing in the world? Why I've orchestrated things the way that I have? Why there's a time for this and a time for that? Why I'm doing all of these things? It's wisdom that's seeking to understand the why, to comprehend the why. Job 28, 23 through 28, think about Job. He's just had this dialogue back and forth with his three friends. He's sitting on the ash pile. He's trying to ask the question, why? He says, I want to understand why. I want to comprehend why. And Job says, I wish I had wisdom. I wish I had wisdom to understand why, to comprehend what's going on. I wish I had that. I would seek for it more than I would seek for treasure. Job 28, 28, behold, the fear of God, that is wisdom. Everyone seeks after treasure. Everyone seeks after money. Everybody seeks after wealth. Everybody seeks to continue in this cycle of produce, consume, produce, consume. Who's seeking after wealth? who is seeking truly after wisdom. We see the contrast between a correct understanding of spiritual wisdom and worldly wisdom. Now, turn with me to Colossians 1. I know I'm all over the place. I'm going to a lot of different passages, but I want us to understand from a biblical perspective, what is the process that we're talking about? Because whenever I say the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, I'm talking about an initiation point. I'm talking about a beginning. It doesn't say the fear of God is the end of wisdom. It says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So I want to understand the process. If I'm starting with wisdom, and if I'm starting with the fear of God, and that's moving me to wisdom and helping me to understand, if, if let's say the fear of God is the key that unlocks the door to move into wisdom, to try to comprehend, to try to understand, then where do we go from there? What's the process? Now, Colossians 1, uh, let's start in verse 9. Paul does something fantastic here. He does something Beautiful in this passage. Colossians 1 9, because of this, we also, from the first day that we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, in order to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing in all things. Uh, bearing fruit, increasing in the knowledge of him, being strengthened with all power. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. The question is, what exactly is Paul praying for the Colossians? Is Paul praying that they would give thanks to the Father? Yes, but not exactly. Is Paul praying that they would bear fruit? Yes, but not exactly. Be strengthened with all power, increasing in the knowledge of him. Walking worthy. What exactly is Paul praying? He says, I pray that you would understand. I pray that you would comprehend. And if you comprehend, if you are filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, then all of these things work out of that. In order to walk worthy, verse 10, if you're filled with the knowledge of his will, in order to walk worthy comes out of that. Bearing fruit comes out of that. Increasing still more in the knowledge of him comes out of that. Being strengthened comes out of that. Giving thanks to the Father comes out of all of those, or comes out of that. 
Paul says, I'm praying one thing for you, that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. Paul is pulling on this Old Testament idea of wisdom. I want to understand, I want to comprehend, I want to grasp what is God doing, what is God accomplishing. And the beautiful thing that Paul sets up for us here in Colossians 1.9 is he links together the idea of comprehension, of understanding, with your change. Comprehension is never, ever something that happens in isolation. True comprehension, let me say true theological comprehension, true theological understanding never happens in isolation. It's meant to transform you. It's meant to shape you, to change you. Your theological education should never, ever come to the point where you're learning something and it's not changing and shaping your character, changing who you are. He who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion. The beautiful thing about sanctification is that you as a Christian, if you have the Spirit of God in you, your sanctification takes place and occurs through your process of comprehension. I comprehend more about the love of Christ because of this passage that I'm studying, because of whatever brings about that comprehension. That then changes me. That transforms me. I cannot comprehend more about the love of Christ and not myself be changed according to that love and be transformed according to that love. The fear of God begins that journey. The fear of God begins the journey to wisdom because it's the fear of God that determines my understanding. It determines my starting place. I have to first grasp my place before God. I have to first comprehend who God is, especially in my relationship with him. Who am I and who is God? God's the one who determines all of these things. God is the one who is sovereign over all of these things. I cannot learn I cannot understand, I cannot comprehend apart from that theological understanding. So Colossians 1, 9 through 12, gives that Paul paints a beautiful picture to say, I want you to comprehend, I want you to understand his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And the basis that all spiritual wisdom and understanding brings about all of these changes. Now, if we go to James, you don't have to turn there, but if we go to James chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, James piggybacks on this idea, or the ideas, I should say, are connected. And James talks about the relationship between spiritual wisdom and earthly wisdom. What is earthly wisdom? What are the characteristics of it? And what's spiritual wisdom? What is true understanding? What is true spiritual wisdom? Spiritual wisdom, he describes as being pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruit, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Worldly wisdom is characterized as selfish ambition. Worldly wisdom is characterized as arrogance. Because you're in the system... The only reason I have arrogance, the only reason I have selfish ambition is because I didn't start with the fear of God at the beginning. I didn't orient my learning, I didn't orient my worldview according to the fear of God. I started with myself. And so all of my striving, all of my worldly wisdom from that point on is only ever going to be characterized by arrogance. It's only ever going to be characterized by selfish ambition because it can't go anywhere else. It's just caught in a continual system. It's caught in a continual cycle. And when we think about learning, when we think about the process of theological education, and again, I'm not just talking in terms of seminary classroom. I'm talking about your formation. I'm talking about your learning as a Christian has to be based first and foremost as its foundation on the fear of Yahweh, the fear of God But the question is, where then does it go? I have one last passage for us to take a look at. 1 John chapter 4. 
1 John chapter 4. The fear of Yahweh, the fear of God, is the beginning of wisdom. The text does not say that the fear of God is the end of wisdom. It doesn't even say that the fear of God is wisdom. It doesn't say they're one and the same thing. It says the fear of God is the starting point for wisdom. Fear of God is the basis for wisdom. I have to first start with that and all of the ramifications that come with that. My place before God, which brings about a sense of dread, which brings about a humility. Who am I? God's the one who has orchestrated everything. God's the one who's sovereign over everything. Who am I in relationship to God? That begins us on our wisdom journey. Wisdom seeks to understand the world around us, seeks to comprehend, seeks to grasp what it is that God is doing in the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment. The one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And you say, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Perfect love casts out fear. There is no fear in love. Well, didn't the Old Testament, didn't all these passages tell me that I absolutely need the fear of Yahweh? Didn't it just explain to me I have to have the fear of Yahweh to start comprehending, to start understanding wisdom in order to grasp what God is doing? And this is the beautiful picture that's painted across all of the pages of scripture. We start with the fear of God. We start with a correct understanding, at least I should say a foundational understanding of who we are before God. That leads us to wisdom, which is an attempt to understand who God is and what God is doing. It leads, us to, it leads us to the starting path to say, this is how I interpret the world around me. This is how I understand the world around me. This is how I should grasp what God is doing and why he's doing it. It's wisdom. And Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, if you meet someone who says, I've got it, they don't have it. If you meet someone that says, I understand, I've got wisdom, I grasp it. Solomon, understood as the wisest man on the earth, says he doesn't have it. He's giving a little bit of a pun on himself. And if somebody comes and says, oh, I, I understand, I've got it, he doesn't have it. Wisdom is a process, a lifelong process. And again, we're trying to understand what love is. We're trying to understand what's true humility. We're trying to understand the character of God. We're trying to understand how God has orchestrated the world, brought all of these things about in order to demonstrate his own glory, in order to demonstrate his character. Wisdom, or I should say the fear of God, is that key that opens the door and you walk into the room and you go, this room has no limit. It has no boundaries. I can't grasp it like I can grasp other things. I can't understand it like I can understand other things. I can grasp some concepts. I can get some things, but I'm always constantly growing in my understanding. Even starting with the fear of God, I jump into wisdom. I seek to understand wisdom, to use wisdom as a tool to grasp God's character and what he's doing and why he's doing it. And at the end of my life, like Solomon, I say, man, if somebody comes to you and says they, they understand, they got it, they don't have it. They definitely don't have it. But what is the 
beautiful thing about what John adds to this in 1 John is he gives us the end. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is the process to understand who God is. And John gives us a picture of the end. Even thinking about 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. There will come a time, you as a Christian, there will come a time in your existence in which you will see God. And in the time of seeing him, Everything that you've been striving for, all of the comprehension that you've sought after, all of the books that you've read, and all of the time that you've spent examining scripture, the comprehension, the understanding, you'll say, I get it. I understand we will be like him. When he appears, We will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Just seeing him, comprehending or seeing him, transforms us immediately that we would be like him. John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. In that culmination, when we stop, let's say love is at 40,000 feet, we're trying to jump up to grasp it, And understand what it is. But when we reach that 40,000 foot view. John says there's no fear in love. Just as hope has finished. Just as hope is fulfilled. So the whole process is fulfilled. I have to start with the fear of Yahweh. I have to start with that understanding of my place before him. And all that comes out of that, my humility, my dread, my, all of those things that come out of that fear of God, my understanding of what he's doing moves me into wisdom to understand what is God's nature, what is his character, what is he like as a Christian, as I grow in that understanding and ultimately in the end as I see Christ and I become like him because I see him as he is. Ultimately, John says, then there's no fear in love because you're perfected in love. You reach that 40,000 feet, you're perfected in love and there's no need for fear. There's no need for fear. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. It's a beautiful picture that Solomon, Paul, John, They're all trying to paint for us. They're all trying to get us to understand that picture. So when we ask the question, what is it that we're trying to accomplish in theological education? The answer is the same thing that we should say. What are we trying to accomplish in our Christian life, in our sanctification? Comprehension for the purpose of transformation, Christ-likeness. And the more that we examine the scripture, the more that we study, the more that we encourage each other, this provides us those answers. This provides us a little bit more of a step into that room, a little bit more of an understanding of who God is and why he's done what he has. And ultimately, it provides us with a greater love for who God is. Abiding in him, faithfulness to him, love for him, all of it rooted and founded in the character of God himself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we do desire to know you. We desire to be faithful to you. Lord, we do not ever want to engage in futility uh, of trying to learn or trying to understand or trying to comprehend only for arrogance, for selfish ambition, for wickedness, Lord. We desire to be humble. We desire to come before you, Lord, knowing that you are the answer. Knowing, Lord, that you not only orchestrate all things, but you work all things together for our good. And so, Father, we humble ourselves before you. We desire to know you. We praise you, Lord, for your kindness towards us. And we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to study your word. Help us to be faithful. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.